Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely going to be a fun one. I think I've just had the most fun I've had with audio in a really long time. And this video is actually 50 years in the making. It has literally taken me 50 years to do what I just did yesterday, and that is listen to a brand new factory recorded reel-to-reel -reel for the first time in my life. And while I'm very familiar with reel-to-reel -reel recordings as I've recorded on them, I've had bands recorded on them, I've heard factory recorded reel-to-reels from back in the day and have always been extremely impressed with them, especially when they are recorded using commercial, professional, studio-grade reel-to-reels. So if you're curious to see how that experience went for me, that's what we're gonna talk about. I'm actually kind of doing a little bit of a shootout. One of my favorite records, The White Stripes Elephant, which came out in 2003. And we're gonna be looking at four different versions of this album. One being the third man record pressing that came out here not too long ago. We're also going to stream this album through Tidal. And I just opened up my brand new UHQR. And I also just opened up my Ultra Tape from Analog Productions. This is a two track 15 inches per second factory recorded reel of the White Stripes Elephant. This honestly took a little bit to do um, as I had to get equipment serviced, my reel to reel up to spec. I wanted to make sure I was doing this right as these reels aren't cheap. And we'll get into the equipment I used, but first let's talk about the White Stripes Elephant just for a little bit of background in case you've never heard it. So the White Stripes, two piece band from Detroit, stripped down blues, garage rock, good songs. Jack White is one of those musicians that insists on recording to tape and using only analog. Another reason why I was so excited when I heard that they were putting out a reel to reel version of this album. I beat this album into the ground. It's kind of like Appetite for Destruction or Zeppelin IV. Some of those albums that you wear several cassettes out or several records out over the years you own them. I remember my girlfriend at the time pretty much threatened me that if I played this album one more time, she was going to strangle me. It's maybe a little bit on the unpolished side. There are a lot of blemishes in this album, but that's what I like. That's what gives it its authenticity in my opinion. You know, the fact that you can make these great songs with just a couple instruments really goes to show you how good the songwriting is. And so if you go into this album knowing it's not pro tooled to death, there's no cutting and pasting going on. I think Jack's goal was to just make this an honest representation of what you would expect live. I saw the White Stripes on this tour perform at Keller Auditorium in Portland. It was absolutely incredible. Um, just two people on stage, just raw power. That's the White Stripes. So that is Elephant. Most likely you've at least heard Seven Nation Army. If, if you've watched any sporting event in the last 10 years, you know that song. There are a lot of really good songs on there. That's actually probably one of my least favorite songs on the record. I think Little Acorn is up there. Hardest Button to Buttons up there. Black Math, I really like. This is just a really good album start to finish. Do yourself a favor. Go stream it. See if the white stripes are maybe your new thing. Let's go over the gear. In my head, I wanted to assemble the perfect vintage stereo system for reel to reel. And it just so happened that Rob, the lead tech at Skylabs, had just finished going through a Dynaco ST70, a Pass 2 preamplifier, and he did the works on it. It's all new tubes, all new caps. It's just, it's dialed. So, Obviously, I was going to pick that. I then grabbed my AR3As. Absolutely one of the best vintage speakers out there. And of course, we put the AR3As on top of our custom speaker stands, which also reminds me, we have a new pair of speaker stands just released last week. This is a nice three inch riser with no screws, no glue, easy to assemble, perfect. And for the turntable, Keeping it vintage, I went for the Gerard or the Gerard, however you say it. 
I've got a 301 that had just been refurbished by Chris at Woodsong. Did an amazing job on that. And then for the reel-to-reel, -reel, I've got my TAC 3300 two-track master. When I saw the news that Acoustic Sounds was going to be releasing this on reel-to-reel, -reel, I immediately took the heads off my deck, sent them to John French, had him relap them, and then I had Steve Urison at Travis Audio Video do the calibration on it once I got those heads back. So every piece of vintage gear that we used is as dialed in as you can dial something in. I am very happy with this setup. And for the streaming, we actually used a Weem. We went out the toss link. We went into a Cambridge Audio Magic DAC 100. So to make this process even more enjoyable, I invited Eric, our video editor, to stop by and do the test with me just to see what he thinks. I trust his ear as well. And we figured we would listen to one song off of each format. We picked Ball and a Biscuit. I just thought this song could really showcase all the dynamics, the little nuances, because you got these really kind of stripped down quiet passages, and then you have these huge wall of sound type of moments. And so we went with streaming first, and honestly, I was very impressed. I had just gotten the DAC magic. I'm not a big DAC person, but it's something I want to get into a little bit more. I've heard really good things about the DAC magic, so that's what I picked up Black Friday when it was on sale. I was really impressed. I mean, it sounded really good. It was really clean. It was really big. You know, it, it had everything I was looking for. I, I would be happy with that all day long. It's really amazing how far I think streaming has come. This is not the same streaming and the same DAX and the same audio we were getting 10, 15 years ago. This has really come a long ways. So if you wrote off streaming and digital sourced music, you really might want to reconsider it. You know, it, it's never going to replace records for me entirely, but for the convenience and the cost, I was impressed. And, and so was Eric. We, we were both impressed. And moving on, we grabbed the Third Man Records press of this album. And for those of you that don't know, Third Man Records is also owned by Jack White. So this is no shock to me that this record sounds really good, being that he owns the pressing plant that made the record. I'm sure he was pretty stringent on making sure it's the best that record can sound to him the way he wanted to hear it. However, my pressing did have a good amount of surface noise. At parts, especially when it got quiet, that surface noise was a little bit distracting. That was the main thing I took out of this. It sounded great, it really did. Again, if this was my only copy of the vinyl record, I would be very happy with this. You know, that's just the way it goes with vinyl sometimes. You know, especially when you're buying, you know, kind of a run of the mill copy, you know, your copy of the third man records elephant might be dead quiet, but mine had a, had a decent amount of surface noise in it. And that kind of bums me out as it, it really does kind of distract you. You know, every pop and click I hear just takes you out of your head, even for a second. Uh, otherwise sounded great. And next we moved on to the UHQR, and I want to say this, I don't think it destroyed the third man records pressing. I don't think that's really possible. You know, with records and premium records, it's not like they can change the laws of physics. I think what these premium products offer is really quality control and more consistency. This record, this pressing was dead quiet. I mean, dead quiet. If the goal of your stereo system is to trick you into closing your eyes and visualizing the band playing and feeling like you're in the same room with them, every time you hear a pop or a click, if that pop or click pulls you out of that moment, then the magic trick is kind of over. So having ultra clean, quiet records comes at a cost. I think that's where a little bit of that premium price tag comes in. You know, when you buy a UHQR or any of the premium records being offered out there, I think you're eliminating the possibility of getting a dud. 
you know, when you're buying a standard issue release, are they really doing that much quality control? Or, you know, for that 25 or $30, are they just kind of kicking them out? You know, we see this with cartridges too. You know, those kind of entry level cartridges that are, you know, they're stamping out thousands of them at a time. Are they really inspecting these cartridges as they come off the assembly line to, to make sure that they're within their tolerance of error? Probably not. And it's most likely the same way with most records. And I think when you're stepping up to a UHQR or a more premium record, you're definitely paying for the quality control that goes in to make sure that that record sounds as good as a record can sound. And I definitely think that is what that UHQR sounded like. It was dead quiet and it sounded great. There's no question. If you're buying a premium record product thinking that you're gonna get the amount of money more that it costs for that record in sonic quality, I think you're kind of missing the point. I think what you're paying for with that extra price is the consistency, knowing that these are small batch runs and that the people that are manufacturing them, their reputation's on the line and they're really making sure that they don't disappoint their customer. And to me, a lot of these premium record pressings are out of my price range, unless it's a special title to me. For those out there that have um, the money to be able to buy every record that comes out in a UHQR or a one step, you know, that's great. You did something right in your life and it doesn't matter. Um, for me, I kind of have to sit back and go, you know, do I really love that album? Or am I okay with just having the blue collar version? If a record like Elephant comes out again, I'll definitely be buying the UHQR because um, I want the best of some albums, albums that are really important to me. And that's all it is. I'm not gonna make up stuff that the UHQR had a, a bigger sound stage and a, a wider presentation and the bass was just elevated and the mids were just more mid and there's, there's no point. It sounded incredible. So did the Third Man Records. The UHQR just allowed me to be in that moment a little bit longer without being distracted by a pop or a click. And so if that relates to sounding better, then the UHQR sounds better. And getting to the reason why I think a lot of you are watching, and that is the real to real. And I, I'm not gonna lie, it is absolutely incredible. If I could have every album that I love on a factory recorded or a, a reel to reel that was recorded with a really nice tape head and tape deck, I absolutely would. There's something about tape saturation, it's different and in a lot of ways better. I feel like it's everything that I love about vinyl records and the analog format coupled with just a pristine presentation. It's clean, there's no pops and clicks. When tapes are done right and they've got the noise floor really low, it just sounds clean and punchy, yet that tape saturation, it does something to the music. You know, this is undeniable. Anybody that's recorded in a studio before on tape or anybody that's heard a factory recorded reel-to-reel -reel knows this, but it's not anything somebody can describe. At least, I don't think anybody could have described it to me. And the best I think I can do, for me, a really good reel-to-reel -reel does two things that I don't hear on other mediums or other formats. And one of the things I've always noticed, either recording in a studio as the musician or as the engineer, because I've done both, is that drum room mics and really crunchy guitars sound really good on tape. There's something about that distortion, that tape saturation, that really kind of gets in your teeth. And so if you like fuzzy guitars or you know big overdriven guitars, there's something about the way those sound when they're recorded on analog tape. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people still record on analog tape if they can't afford it. Um, these are very expensive. They're very expensive to maintain. There's not a lot of people that know how to do tape calibration. We actually spent 
a couple weeks or a month on Tape Cal when I went to recording engineering school, and I've forgotten way more than I remember. So when you look at the cost of brand new reel-to-reel tape, which is very niche at this point, and you think about everything that Acoustic Sounds has to go through in order to make these tapes, you start to see why the cost is where it's at. There is definitely some heavy sticker shock with these. No question, this is not for everybody. Unfortunately, you can't just grab any 10-inch reel-to-reel vintage machine out there. Most of those are four-track. They're not two-track, and they're not 15 inches per second. So definitely do your homework before you just jump on eBay and buy a a 10-inch reel-to-reel deck thinking you're going to grab an ultra reel from Acoustic Sounds and try one of these. I wish it was something I could experience more, but I'm in the same boat as a lot of you out there where I can't afford a really nice high-end two-track deck and to buy a lot of these reel-to-reels. It's just not possible. And what I came away with after the last couple days of listening to these different formats and pressings and whatnot was, you know, everything is really about trade-offs. I don't think one is any better than the other. They all have their strengths and their weaknesses. You know, digital being, it's cheap. You don't have to store it. You can transport it very easily. There's a lot of really good things about digital files, especially with all the innovations that have happened with digital audio streaming in the last 10 or 15 years. And then with records, you've got an analog format that is still reasonably cheap to get into. And it's got, it's got that tactile feel. It's got the fun of going out and hunting it down because there's so much of it out there, even used, you know, bargain shopping, thrifting. That is definitely a huge part of vinyl records for a lot of other reasons. And, and then you've got the reel to reel side, which is, you know, the negatives for that are the cost. They're not portable. It's not something you just throw on and kind of go about your day and listen to in the background. There's a lot of maintenance involved with reel-to-reels. It's definitely something that you need to either, you know, jump in with both feet or just stay away from because there's just a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. There's a lot of maintenance that's going to need to happen. Unfortunately, still today, I think reel-to-reel is kind of... It's more for the people that are well off, just like it was when I was growing up. We never had a reel-to-reel player. I remember seeing at some of my friends' houses, some doctors and people like that, and um, thinking, wow, you know, that thing looks cool. That is awesome. What is that? You know, finding out it was a reel-to-reel, it, was, it wasn't a projector. It wasn't for film. It was actually for audio. And maybe even asking my dad, you know, hey, what's up? Why don't we have one of these? It's so cool. And I'm sure the first thing he said was, yeah, you go buy one, you know, you go get a job. You can have one. We had a blast. Eric and I had a blast. I actually came back in today and rather than shooting this video right away, I grabbed my phase linear 700 B. I wanted a a higher power solid state amplifier. And then I grabbed the Thedra from gas, a really nice preamp to try that. That sounded great too. If any of you have had the experience where you you buy a new piece of equipment and it just takes everything up a level and it makes you want to re-listen to all of your music to see if you can hear something that maybe you've been missing even though you've heard it a thousand times, that's what this was like. It just, it was in reverse. It was, uh, you know, like a new format that was forcing me to, well, I wonder what it sounds like on this stereo or, you know, I wonder what it sounds like on that because, um, it is so unique. It's so different than everything else. And I think as long as you know the limitations or the strengths of any format or type of music or piece of equipment, it really will help you get the most enjoyment out of that format or piece of equipment or any of that kind of thing. And I want to thank you all for watching another video from Skylabs. I really appreciate it. I do want to let you know This might be the last video of the year, being the holidays and just how busy we are around the shop. I might have to put a hold on the videos just for the last couple weeks. Maybe we'll get a live stream in there. If you wake up Sunday morning and you don't get a, this is going to be a fun one. um, I'm sorry, we'll be back soon. It's just that uh, we're going a thousand miles an hour. So 
thank you all for watching. Thank you.